to jump right in and uh, share my theme verse that we're going we're gonna to share this every week this month. It uh, really encapsulates the go and tell it theme. And it's in Isaiah 52 and verse 7. It says, how beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace, who bring good tidings, who proclaim salvation, and who say to Zion, your God reigns. Now, church, this is the heart of our father. You know, he's, he tells us to go tell it. He, he, we have a mandate from God to be his hands and feet, to be the ones that bring good news. And he says here, he's speaking through Isaiah here, and he's saying, how beautiful are the feet of those who are proclaiming that salvation, who are bringing that good news. He, is, he has called us to do that. He has empowered us to be his people that will go and share that good news. You know, when he, when he came uh, on to earth, was born in a manger, everything about the, the origin of Jesus' earthly life was very meager and modest and unassuming, right? He didn't come with trumpets. He didn't come with this great big blast. God could have made the, the clouds speak and say that Jesus is here and you all need to know the Messiah is on earth. He didn't do that. He came in a quiet way because he wanted us to take his message, to take it out to the people and to, and to influence our world. And, uh, you know, he, he gave us his Holy Spirit to do that. And it's, it's how he empowers us to do it because he has called us to be his witnesses. You know, Jesus said right before he ascended back into heaven, Jesus said, you're going to have power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, but you're going to have that power to be my witnesses. You know, we, we love, as Pentecostals, we love to talk about the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, the Holy Spirit in us helps us. We can lay hands on the sick and they'll be healed. We can, uh, we can the Holy Spirit empowers us to resist temptation and there's fruit in our life that comes from having the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. But the, Jesus said right before he left, he said, the power of the Holy Spirit is so that you can be my witnesses. So you can go and tell the world of the love of the Father and what God has done for you. And you in turn can share that with other people. That's God's heart. And, you know, we know it's not always easy to share our faith. You know, we're in a culture today that, that a lot of people have the mindset of just, you know, you do your thing, I'll do my thing. And I hope God gets you and praise God. But, but uh, that's not really God's heart for us. He didn't call us to just do our own thing. You know, in fact, I'm going to make my little plug for church here, but it's one of the biggest reasons we go to church and we have this community of believers so that we can come together, we can be encouraged, we can be uh, challenged with one another to remind ourselves that there is a world outside of those doors that needs and deserves to hear about the love of the Father just as much as we did. Amen? And so we come together like this. We come in community. You know, coming to church doesn't make you saved, but when saved people come to church, it reminds us of the, the, the fact that, yes, yes, when we worship God, yes, he really is that great. Emmanuel, God is with us. What a powerful message that we have a God that is with us everywhere we go. And, when he, and if he's with us, it's so that we can, he can go with us so that we can share that truth to the world and be, in, be influencing our world that God has put us in. And, uh, you know, the Great Commission... Is, is probably the most famous uh, thing that Jesus said in regards to what our, the people of God are called to do. And it's in Matthew 28. Most of you probably know it. I'm going to read it. It's in verses 18 and 20. He says, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go. Everybody say go. Go. go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. I love the last line of that. He, he doesn't just give us this mandate and say, okay, listen, I'm worth it. You just need to go do it and listen, obey me. He says, not only do I, do I expect you to do it, but he said, I'm gonna go with you. He's not just telling us to go and tell it. He says, I want you to partner with me in going and telling it. And he's gonna do it with us. He's, he, that's, that's the Holy Spirit living in us. When we are out there, you may, you may be the only one in your family that, that you would say is saved and is a Christian. And, but that's okay because you're never alone when you're going to share the love of God because Jesus says, I'm with you always. I'll never, ever let you do this by yourself. The Holy Spirit is there to help us, to empower us, to give us what we need to be able to share the love of God with those that we come in contact with and those in our world. And I think it's also interesting here that he says, teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. Teach them to obey everything that I have commanded you. Obedience is the evidence of salvation. Our obedience to God is evidence that we are saved. Now, before you jump on me and say, no, no, we're not saved by our works. We're saved by grace through faith. Nobody believes that more than me. But and what I'm saying here is not that, that obedience is what makes you saved. Obedience reflects the fact that you are saved. 
And he tell, Jesus tells us there to tell the people, like when you, when you share your faith, when you talk about me and people say, yes, I want that. And, you, and they receive Jesus. They allow him into their heart and they receive his forgiveness of sins. He says, then I want you to teach them to obey all my commands. We are called to do that. We are called to obey his commands. And one of his commands is to go into your world and share the gospel. When he said go into all the world, he's not telling all of us to go to China or Russia or Alaska or wherever it might be. Some of us are called as missionaries to go out, and that's great, but we're all called to go into our world. God has put people in every one of our lives that need to know this love that we've experienced, this Emmanuel that's with us, this God that has come in the earthly form to come with us and dwell in us and give us the power to live for him. We're all called to do that. That's what the Great Commission is. And you know, going has always been a part of the Christian faith. There's always an element of going in our walk. You know, some of us want to think, you know, you may think, well, what about the verse that says, be still and know that I am God? Well, that, that's referring to something completely different. We are, we're called to, when we're, when we're talking about being still, it's about not trying to achieve to win God's favor. You know, we're not trying to, to, uh, to do things on our own. We can, we can know that he's God and be still in that. But at the same time, he, Jesus said very clearly, go. Uh, he said, I'm sending you out. And in fact, going started right after Jesus was born. That, that mandate in our life started immediately after Jesus was born. And I'm gonna show you here in, in the, the story in Luke 2, which is the Christmas story that you probably hear every year if you're in church. Uh, it's, it's the most read one. Um, there, there's a couple of really neat things in here that I want you to see. I'm gonna read this, this story out of Luke 2, 8 to 18. It says, and there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were terrified. So let me stop right there. An angel of the Lord appeared to these shepherds. So even an angel was sent to go to these shepherds. It says later that the angel went back to heaven later. So the angel was sent from heaven to actually tell these shepherds about the fact that Jesus was being born. It says, but the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone back into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told about this child and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. So the shepherds, as soon as they they saw, they were sent to go see the baby Jesus. And then after they saw him, it says that they went out and they spread the word about him. And the people were amazed at what the shepherds were saying to them. So the shepherds immediately went. They were sent out immediately to go and tell of this good news. God uses us to spread his love. That's what he does. We are the vessels that God uses to spread the love that he has for each and every one of his children. Somebody told you about the love of Jesus. Somebody had to tell you. My mom told me at such a young age, I don't even remember the first time, I was raised hearing about how much Jesus loved me. And I'm very thankful for that. And so the only way people will know is if we tell them. And there's always an element of going. Jesus, in his earthly ministry, he sent out his 12 disciples. He said, I am sending you out as sheep among wolves. Boy, how would you like that commission? Hey, I'm sending you out. You're going to be a sheep among a bunch of wolves. That was Jesus telling his disciples, basically saying, I'm sending you out into the slaughterhouse. You're going to be outmanned. You're going to be outnumbered. But I'm going to go with you. He didn't care that they were going to go among wolves. The message is too important. It has to go out. And then you look at, at the story of the blind man in John 9. The, the man was born blind. He came to Jesus and said, please heal my sight. And Jesus bends down and gets some dirt and makes some mud with his own saliva. You probably remember this story. He rubs it in the guy's eyes. And could the guy see right away? Nope. He told him, he said, go to the pool of Siloam and rinse. The guy, that, the, the guy could have said, well... Man, I mean, you put all this mud in my eyes and making me think I was going to see, and I can't see. Why would I go all the way down here after you didn't do what I thought you were going to do? He didn't do any of that. It took, he took a step of faith. He stepped out, and he went. And you know the story. He was healed at that moment, completely healed. And there's always going to be that element in our relationship with God. And what I'm, 
I'm here to tell you today that there are aspects of the character of God. There are blessings that come from your relationship with God that you will never experience until you are willing to step out. God reserves some blessings and some, some revelation of his love for you for the people that are willing to step out and go and tell it. It's a fact you can take it to the bank. There's no question about it. That, that God believes in that so much. He says, for, he says to us, he would say to you, I poured my love into you, okay? And you, you've experienced my, my love for you, my relationship with you. Now, it's, it's your responsibility to go share it. If you don't, okay, I mean, you don't lose your salvation by not sharing your faith, okay? You still go to heaven, but you're missing out on so much more that he has for you. Because he reserves those things for those that he knows are going to take it and that, that their feet are going to be beautiful and bring good news to those that are on the mountain. It, it, I would compare it to uh, the difference between a flip phone and a smartphone. You know, I was walking down the sidewalk the other day and I saw a guy with a flip phone and I thought, huh, I don't see those very often anymore. You know, more power to him, I guess. But my, my, we're, we're, so, we're so wired, you know, programmed by these things now because my first thought was, well, how does he text his friends, you know, which I know you can text on a flip phone, but then I'm like, how does he check the news? You know, I mean, you start going through all these things, like things he can't do because he's got a flip phone. You know, when you get that smartphone, I remember the first time I got a smartphone from a a regular phone and I mean, the world just opens up to you. You know, there's so much you can do, your email, your text, you can surf the internet, you can get these apps. I, I have an app on my phone that turns on these, all these Christmas trees in the building. How cool is that? Of course, now that I say that, I sound really lazy. But, but you'd be surprised how long it takes to walk around here and turn everything on. And uh, I have an app that turns off all the air conditioners in the building or turns them on. And a lot of you know that because when it's hot, you come and yell at me and tell me to pull out my phone. But I mean, we have apps now that can do everything and anything. It just, the world just opens up, you know, when you experience that compared to the old style of flip phone or car phone. And, and that's how I, that's, that's the comparison I see when it comes to whether or not we're willing to step out and go and tell it. And do the things that God, that Jesus has asked us to do, to be his witnesses, to be his, uh, the bearers of his love to this world. He asks us to do that and he expects it from us. But there's such great blessing that comes when we do it. Amen. Now, this has been a struggle forever. Okay. It's always a struggle. The enemy, one of his biggest tactics is to keep us from sharing our faith because there's so much power in it. So it is a struggle. It's a struggle for everybody, even the most anointed evangelist. When it comes to actually sharing your faith one-on-one with someone, there, there's always that tension there because you don't want to set people off. You don't want to say the wrong thing. You don't want to look like you're high and mighty and you're talking down to them and, and you don't know if they'll accept what you say. And, and there, there's always that tension there. And I think there's a lot of things that keep us from sharing our faith. And, you know, I was just, as I was preparing this and I was thinking through it and praying, I just felt like there was a few things that, that the Lord showed me that, that I want to share with you guys that I think keep us from sharing our faith with people and be in that, that city on a hill, that light that, that God calls us to be. Uh, and hopefully by going through these, we can see that, that these are things that we can in, be intentional about dealing with in our life, okay? And, and the first reason that I think we don't tell it is, is by far the number one reason. It's just flat out fear. It's just fear. We, we as human beings struggle with fear. I think, I think most of us, at the end of the day, we'd love to be able to share our faith with someone and share our faith with our hairdresser or, or, or a, a waitress or, or somebody in our life or, or a family member or a neighbor or coworker, whatever it is. But we just get paralyzed sometimes because I think in our mind, we visualize sharing your faith as that, like that picture of Jessica on Bel Air Road. Maybe you guys can put that back up so we can see exactly what, uh, what that looks like for each one of us. Yeah. So she's out there. Obviously she was... Uh, what a, a great trooper doing that, looking kind of foolish, standing out there, and the people that went by were gracious to her. But, but I think that's how we visualize sharing our faith, going and telling it. You know, go into all the world, make disciples. Like that means we got to stand on a soapbox and yell through a bullhorn. That's not how we have to do it. We don't have to be afraid to share our faith because there are people that are called to stand on the street corner, and some people that have been effective doing that. But for most of us, that's not the way we're going to do it. We're going to do it in the confines of a relationship and people we love that we built that bridge of love in their life. But nevertheless, we fear being able to share that faith. And, and I would go as far as to say there's a few different aspects of fear even that we deal with when it comes to sharing our faith. And I want to give you a few of those. I think the first one is rejection. We as human beings fear rejection. That's normal for every one of us. That's a normal reaction. Nobody wants to feel rejected. Nobody. And all, probably all of us have experienced it at some point in our life. And we know how it feels. And it's not good. 
And so it's very real because we, we can be concerned that, oh, if I, if I put myself out there and I say, well, you know, I'm a Christian and, and can I tell you about Jesus and what he's done in my life? And you feel like you're, you're, the, the enemy has done a good job of making us feel like, oh, if you do that, you're going to be labeled. You know, people don't want to hear about your stinking faith. They're just going to label you as a pro-life homophobe if you try to talk about Jesus, you know, and they're, and they're going to call you a religious nut and you're, you're that guy and nobody can do anything around you or have any fun around you because you're, you're one of those Christians. And, and we, we can build that story up in our own mind when nine times out of 10, it's not even true. Most people, when you want to talk to them about your faith, they'll, they'll listen to you and we can do that. But we, we worry about, oh, what are they going to do? They're going to reject me. And, and we get afraid of that. So we just clam up. We don't say anything. And we just hope beyond hope that that person actually maybe, you know, has some kind of experience without us actually telling them. And we, and we can rely on that more than anything. Now, I would say, biblically, you know, it's very clear that when they reject you for your faith, they're not really rejecting you, they're rejecting Jesus. You know, when Samuel was the last judge of Israel and the children of Israel wanted a king, so they went to Samuel and said, give us a king. And Samuel went back, went to God and said, God, they want a king, what do I do? And God said, Samuel, if they want a king, give them a king. It was almost like he was done. And he said, but listen, they're not rejecting you, they're rejecting me. And that's what they're doing when they reject us for our faith, which doesn't necessarily take a lot of the sting out of it because we're the ones that still have to deal with it in the day to day. But what I'm here to tell you today, church, is that our love for people has got to trump our fear of rejection. It's got to trump our fear of rejection. It has to. We cannot live our life worried about just, oh, I don't want to be rejected because of my beliefs. The love that we have for them should make us be able to get past that fear if we really do love people. And we do love people because God has put a spirit in us and caused us to love people. I don't, I don't know about you guys, but before I was saved, I, I didn't really love people a whole lot. I put up with them, you know, but I would say I really had that deep love for them. Now, once I got saved and filled with the Holy Spirit, man, I'm passionately, I love people so much and I, I hate the idea of anybody not coming to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And that's in us. So that has to trump. We need to focus on that love more than the rejection. Amen. I think, I think another reason that we fear is that because we're afraid that we're going to look incompetent or that we are incompetent and really don't know how to share our faith. You know, I, I know that that's something we hear a lot of times, like, man, I'd like to share, but uh, what, if, what if they start asking me questions about the Bible? I don't know the Bible that well, you know? What if they ask me if Adam and Eve had belly buttons, you know? And I would say, well, of course, you just say yes, of course they did, because when, when he made them, he said, you're done and you're done. It's a really, really cheesy joke. Sorry, um, but you know, but but the, that that concern is real because some of us would say, you know, I just don't know that much. You know, I, I pray and I try to read my Bible, but a lot of times I read my Bible, I don't really understand it, and and um, you know, I'm just kind of hanging on myself, and so I don't know, I can't really get into a deep theological conversation with someone because I just don't know enough. And I would say to that, none of us know enough. You know, none of us do. I, I, I feel like I, you know, I love reading the word. I love studying the Bible and I, I love reading Christian literature. But then I watch Robbie Zacharias online and people will grill him and ask atheists will ask him questions and he's so eloquent and says stuff. And I just think, man, I'm an idiot, you know, because he just knows so much. He's just so good at it. But man, there's not many Robbie Zacharias in the world. You know, the thing is, we don't have to have all the answers. We just have to be able to tell them what God's done in our life. You know, we don't have to have it all figured out. We don't have to be perfect. We don't have to be a scholar because frankly, it's not our job to convert people. It's the Holy Spirit's job. Yeah. You know, our job is to share what God's done in our life. And then it's up to the Holy Spirit from that point to take them and change them. Right. We can't save anybody. If you said, hey, I saved this guy. Well, you're sadly mistaken because right. nobody's going to get saved for you. People have to get saved because of Jesus and what he did because yeah. none of us are good enough. So we just share, and if, if people start asking you questions, you know, it's okay to say, I don't know. I say it sometimes. People come up to me and ask me questions about the Bible, and I'll say, you know, I don't really know, but I'll be happy to find out for you. And I turn around and Google it on my phone, you know. So it's okay, you know. We don't have to know it all. We just need to be available for God to be able to use us. I think the third thing that we fear is getting out of our comfort zone. And, oh, this is the big one. We as Americans, especially, we, we spend the majority of our time trying to make ourselves comfortable. And that's okay. You know, I, I, we have thermostats in our house with heating and air. We have thermostats in our car with heating and air. I mean, we want to be comfortable. We wear clothes that are comfortable. We want a comfortable mattress, comfortable furniture. Like, that's just how we're, we're designed. And that's okay to want those things. The, the, the issue here is that we cannot let our desire for comfort in the natural 
carry over into our desire to be comfortable in our faith, okay? Let me tell you something, church. There's nowhere, 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 nowhere. You can scour the word of God. There's nowhere in the Bible that it says that the Christian faith is comfortable and easy and just floating around. I know some people, there's preachers that preach it. Like, oh, Jesus, he'll make your life better. <laughs> that, that's, that's a lie from the pit of hell. Now, he'll, he'll make your heart better, but I'm telling you, your life necessar- won't necessarily get all that better right away. You're still gonna have stuff happening in your life. You know, and, and Jesus can come into those situations and help and make things better. But being a Christian doesn't mean all of a sudden, oh, good, now I just get to float through life now. You know, now I ride in the back of the limousine and sip on my whatever I'm drinking. You know, Jesus said, I, I just told you earlier, he sent the 12 out as lambs, sheep among wolves. That's, that's a big deal. He says, in this world, you're going to have trouble, but you can take heart because I've overcome the world. Jesus does not call us to just live in our comfort zone. In our faith, that's, this is the thing, church. It's always gonna be difficult to, to be a person that's consistently sharing your faith with people. But that's exactly what Jesus wants. He wants us to get out of that comfort zone and to be able to share our faith and to be able to be bold enough to say, you know what, this is awkward, this feels weird, but I'm gonna go ahead and do it because this person's worth it. We, we can't live our Christian life trying to be comfortable all the time, Okay. We have to be willing to stretch ourselves. There is absolutely aspects of the relationship that you will have with God that, that you will not experience until you are willing to get out of that comfort zone and be part of what's, what God's doing. I know as humans, we, we like to blend in. We don't like to rock the boat for the most part. Most people don't like to rock the boat. You know, I have one child that lives to rock the boat, but for the most part, we don't really like to do that. We like to blend in. You know, there aren't many trendsetters in the world. Most people are trend followers. I'm more of a trend follower. It's the reason I'm not wearing an orange suit up here today, you know? I'm not trying to set trends. I'm trying to follow. We try to blend in. And, and that's okay in life. But in our faith, it's, it's not what we're called to do. We're not called to blend. We're called to make a difference. We're called to be the city on a hill, the light that is not put under a bushel, right? To make that difference in the world. Americans will do everything and anything not to suffer. But the gospel spreads when we get out of our comfort zone. The gospel spreads when we get out of our comfort zone. You know, when you see persecution around the world in the church, it, it's, it's heartbreaking to see Christians getting persecuted just because they're, they love Jesus in other parts of the world. We don't really experience it here, but you do see it all over the place. And, and my first reaction is always that it, it always kind of breaks my heart when I see it. But there's another part of me that goes, you know what though? The church in that area is gonna grow. The church always grows when it's persecuted. Always, when people are out of their comfort zones, because there's something about when you have to know why you believe what you believe, and you have to stand up for what you believe and be willing to be persecuted when, when somebody's standing over you, a policeman's standing over you saying, I'm gonna beat you with the butt end of this gun if you don't denounce your faith in Jesus right now. It makes you, there, there's something that rises up in us that says, I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna deny him because he's everything. But we live in this country where it's so comfortable that we can let that, we can let that bleed into our relationship with Jesus too. And we can't do that. We've got to be willing to get out of our comfort zones and stand against that fear and be intentional to share our faith. And then the last, the last aspect of fear is hypocrisy. We don't want to be looked at as hypocrites. The culture that we live in, the enemy and his influence in our culture has convinced a lot of us that we can't really talk about our faith because we don't want to look like hypocrites. You know, because, well, you don't have it all together, so you can't, you can't tell him what to do. You can't judge him. You know, the enemy is the master at twisting scripture. He did it to Jesus when he tempted him in the desert, and he does it to us every day. How many times have you heard, oh, you can't judge me. Judge not, lest you be judged. Doesn't the Bible say that? What about, you know, he who is without sin cast the first stone? That was even Jesus saying that. You can't do that. You can't judge me. I see tattoos, people getting these tattoos now that says only God can judge me. And so we equate that to meaning like, well, I can't talk to them about Jesus then because then I'm judging them. And that's not what it is at all. We're not judging people when we share our faith. We're not judging them at all. What we're doing is we're saying, uh, there's a standard of living that I can't meet. And I know you can't meet because I know that it's impossible for us to meet. But I got some really, really great news. There's this Jesus that came to earth 
that he, and he was God and he put skin on, he came down, he lived a sinless life. And then he was crucified on a cross. And three days later, he rose from the dead and he ascended back into heaven. And if I will receive the forgiveness of my sins through him, I can be completely forgiven. And I can know that I'm going to, I'm in right standing with him and that I'm going to be in heaven when I die. I, that's not judging at all. That's just saying what this says. We're not judging people. We're not throwing stones at them. We're trying to give them a gift. This is, a, I mean, this is the greatest gift that's ever been given. It's like I'm trying to hand you a suitcase full of $10 million. You're saying, don't judge me. You don't know if I'm poor. But we believe that lie. We believe it. Like, oh, I can't say anything because I don't want to sound like I'm judging them. You know, that's, that's not good. That's not what we're doing. We're giving the gift of salvation to people. It's a wonderful thing. We don't have to worry about being hypocrites. Have you ever wondered about the fact of why the angel appeared to the shepherds? Like, we don't think about that a whole lot because when you see the, the plays on stage in church and Christmas, the shepherds are always, you know, always dressed in really nice bathrobes and really clean sheets around their head with a whatever it is that holds the sheet on, you know, and they, they look sophisticated and proper and whatever. And, you know, the Bible talks about the Lord is our shepherd, and there's a lot of good connotation of shepherd in the Bible. But most scholars widely believe that shepherds in Jesus' day were social outcasts. They were the down and out. In fact, I read that they were not allowed to testify in court because their testimony was never considered trustworthy. Rabbis would teach their, their followers, if a, if a shepherd is trying to sell you something, assume it's stolen and don't buy it. They were not even allowed to have their, their, their uh, flocks in the city. They had to be outside of the city limits. It says the, shields, the shepherds were out in the fields watching their flocks by night. Actually, most of the time they lived out there. They were social outcasts. They were the... They were the drug addicts of today, the down and out, the people that just can't get it together. And the angel decides to appear, obviously from the command of God, to appear to these shepherds. Why didn't he appear to the, you know, the learned, the, well, the well-to-do people, the people that had their act together for the most part, you know? I think it's because that's the nature of God. I think that's his character. He, 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 he uses the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. You know, and he, he said, you know what, I'm not going to, not only am I not going to make some huge announcement to the whole world that Jesus is here, and I'm not going to go to the learned people, I'm going to go to the down and out, and I'm going to tell them about Jesus, they're going to go see him, and the Bible says that they went around telling everybody, and everybody was amazed. It, the, the connotation there suggests that everybody believed them, like, oh my goodness, these guys, did you hear what the shepherds saw? And it was like, all of a sudden, they, were, they had a voice because of what God had done in their life. And the people could have said, oh, we don't believe you. You guys are, the, you're shepherds. You're the hypocrites. You know, you don't have your life together. I saw you stole something the other day. Why would I believe what you said? It's not about having everything perfect and having your life all together. It's just about sharing the experience that you've had with Jesus. That's what the shepherds did. That's what God's called us to do. So you don't have to worry about being a hypocrite. You don't have to worry about having it all together and being perfect and making sure you know how you have, you know, the half the New Testament memorized so you can recite it. It's just about sharing that experience you've had and what God's done in your life. Now, I, when it comes to fear and, and, and causing us not to share our faith, I just, church, I just want to challenge you. We've got to get over the fear of people. And we've got to have a healthy fear of God in our life. Amen? The Bible tells us that we should fear God, not be afraid of him, but it talks, it's about having a healthy respect and a reverence for him. And when Jesus is saying, I have commanded you to go, that we need to be more concerned about what Jesus thinks about us than what man thinks about us. Right? right? And he, Jesus said that if you're ashamed of me before man, I'll be ashamed of you when I come back. That's one of the scariest verses in all the Bible to me. Yeah. And, and the, 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 uh, the understanding there, the, the logic that we use, how in the world, and I'm not saying this to you, I'm saying this to all of us, how can we be ashamed of our association with Jesus? We're talking about the guy that created the heavens and the earth, everything we have, he holds it in the palm of his hand. He created you and me. He created the, your innermost being. He knows the numbers of hair on your head. He knows everything about you. He knows all of your days before one of them came to be. And he has this standard. He's perfectly holy. And because we're not, he said, well, I'm not going to hold you to it. I'm going to actually come down and pay your debt for you, which he did for you and me. And invited us to be in a relationship with him. And we're going to be with him in heaven one day. And yet for some unknown reason, we can be embarrassed to talk to people about Jesus. It's really remarkable when you think about it. It makes me think, what are we doing? Like, where, where have we got our thinking wrong? We've allowed the, our culture or the enemy to make us feel like, I don't want to talk about Jesus with this guy because it's going to be weird and awkward. I, I just, I, it's, it's really crazy. And I pray that we can get to where we have such a revelation of Jesus that we don't care if people think we're weird. 
you know? That we're, we're gonna go out, we're gonna proclaim that love that has changed our lives and let the chips fall where they may, amen? Amen, yeah, give God praise for that. All right, let me move along. So the, uh, fear is the first reason I think we don't tell people about Jesus. I think the second one is apathy. I think sometimes we just get apathetic. Uh, the, the visual that I have there is just kind of the shoulder shrug. I don't know if you see it, have that emoji on your phone, but it's kind of like, uh, I just don't know, you know? Like, I'm glad that I'm saved, and, you know, I, I, I like when I hear that people get saved, but I'm just not willing to make it a priority in my life to make sure that people do get saved. That's very real. And I think a lot of us struggle with that. A lot of us deal with that. And, you know, Jesus said that out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. Pastor Bowen preached on that a week or two ago. Out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. We speak about the things that matter to us. The things that are important to us that really matter on the inside, it comes out of our mouth. You know, if Georgia had won last night, everybody would be talking about Georgia today, wouldn't they? In fact, we're probably still talking about them and how upset we are because it's in our heart and it matters, right? Those things matter. We're, we got that photo booth back there. It spits out pictures. We're going to take those pictures. We're going to be excited about it. You're probably going to take pictures of it with your phone and post it on Instagram. Or you're going to take it home and put it on your fridge because those things matter. We get excited. We want to share those things because we like it. So we like Jesus, so we should be wanting to share him, but there's something that keeps us. There's an apathy sometimes that comes in. And I, I would say to that, maybe for some of us, we just don't have much to give. You know, maybe there's just not much left in our heart to give. Maybe you've lost your first love. The Bible talks about losing your first love. Or maybe, maybe your love's just grown cold. Or maybe you've never had an experience like the shepherds had with the angel, you know, saying, hey, Jesus is here. You know, they had that experience. It changed everything for them. They, I, they didn't care who heard it. They were gonna tell everybody because this was the coolest thing they ever heard of. There's, there's a big difference between knowing the Christmas story and experiencing the Christmas story. Amen. I grew up in church. I knew the Christmas story forward and backward. That verse, that section I read in Luke 2, a lot of you could have probably recited it without me even putting it up because we've heard it so many times. I knew it, but man, then when I was about 18, I experienced it and everything changed. I went from just going to church and trying to be a good kid to being passionate about Jesus and passionate about people. I went from thinking I was gonna live in my little hometown in Ohio for the rest of my life to I couldn't wait to get out of there so I could go tell people about Jesus because everybody I knew was saved. And I went into the mission field and I was, and my life's never been the same since. But it was because I experienced it, I didn't just know it. And we need to experience Jesus in that way. You know, I, the, the, uh, the man in, in John chapter nine, the, the blind man, that was, that was healed by Jesus. He experienced Jesus, and man, he was just telling people about what happened to him. You know, the Pharisees and the, the, the leaders were mad. They're saying, why did he, who did, how did he do this? What happened? You know, they didn't really believe what he was saying. They kept pushing him, prodding him, and he finally said, listen, I don't know what to tell you. All I know is that I was blind, and now I can see. And that dude, Jesus over there, is the one that did it. That's all I know. And I'm gonna tell people about it because I'm stinking excited because I was blind as a bat and now I can see perfectly and I'm excited and I'm gonna be telling people. And that needs to be the experience we have, right? That needs to be our experience. And some of us, you know, maybe you've been saved so long, you, you almost just, it's just kind of second nature and you, you've got, you've surrounded yourself with people that are like-minded and saved and Christians and, and, uh, and just all, you're all kind of the same and that's fine. If that's the case, then we've got to make sure we get ourselves out there. We've got to get outside of that circle because there's people outside of our circle, right outside of it, that need the love of Jesus. And we've got to be willing to do that. We can't be apathetic. There's no place for apathy in the Christian walk. The heart of God, when you think about apathy, here's the heart of God. Jesus, he, they left the 99 to go get the one. Man, I struggled with that verse for a long time until I really started understanding the heart of God. It's not that he's leaving and forsaking the 99 that are trying to stay in the circle with Jesus. It's just that his heart is so passionate for that one lost one, he just can't, he can't not go get it. He just can't sit there and be like, well, at least I got 99 out of 100. Like, nope, hang on guys, I'll be right back. And he goes and gets it. That's his heart and that's his heart for us too, that we would go get it. That we wouldn't be okay with, well, you know, 80% of my family saved, that's good, I guess. That, that we would have to say, I've gotta go do what I can do. I've got to share the love of Jesus with, this, with these people because they deserve to know it too. We cannot be apathetic about what God's done in our life. And when we experience his love, because some of you might say, well, you know, I want to experience that, but I don't have that kind of a story to tell people just because, you know, I just, I kind of got saved 20 years ago. And since then, you know, I've just kind of been doing my thing. And 
Um, what I would say to you is get on your knees and beg God to show you, to give you that, uh, to rekindle, to give you that experience, that fresh love in your heart. Because God will answer that prayer. He might not, may not answer it in five minutes, but he will answer that prayer because that's his heart for all of us. You know, when I moved to the South, uh, somebody told me about shrimp and grits and I like shrimp and grits, so I thought they were probably good. But then I experienced them. Mm. I could tell you every restaurant in Augusta now that has good shrimp and grits. And I'm bored, happy to tell you. It, it, when you know about something is one thing, but when you experience it, it, it should change everything. There's no place for apathy when we've experienced something that's that great. Not shrimp and grits, Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So the last, the last reason we don't share our faith that I want to share with you today is, is a misconception. I believe some of us have a misconception of what, what our role is when it comes to sharing our faith. Because I, I, sadly, I actually hear it quite a bit from people that say, well, you know, my faith's a private thing. It's just really private to me. You know, it's, it's, it's me and God. You know, and I have this private faith and, you know, I just, I don't like to push my beliefs on other people. And uh, it's just really private. I have my own way of praying to God. You know, when I read my Bible, it's just, it's just me and him. And to that, I would say, well, you're, you're halfway there, okay? Because that is how it starts. It starts with you and God. It has to begin there. The relationship here between you and him has got to be there. But that's only half of it. The other half is that we have to go out. We have to share it. God doesn't give us that relationship with him so we can just sit there and enjoy it. It's so that we can express it to others. That's, that's what he's done for us. It's, it's like if somebody gave you $10 million and you just sat with it in your room the rest of your life. It wouldn't do you any good. You know, we got to take it out and your friends would hopefully want you to share it, you know. Uh, but, but that's God's heart for us is that we would share our relationship with him with others, you know, and I, and I also hear people say, well, you know, the Bible says that no one can come to the Father unless the Holy Spirit draws them. So it's the Holy Spirit's job to do that. And to that, I would say, <laughs> absolutely, 100%. But tell me, where does the Holy Spirit reside? In us. He's in each one of us. So he's using us to draw them, okay? We can't say it's the Holy Spirit's job to, to draw them if we're just, and we're just gonna sit back and hope for the best. The Holy Spirit's in us. And he has sent us out to go and share that love that he has for us, okay? It's the Holy Spirit's job to do the, the saving and the converting, but he uses us. We are his hands, we are his feet to this lost world. And then I, and I think some people would also say, well, you know, it's the, that's the pastor's job. That's the church staff job to, to share the gospel, you know, and to, to tell the people about Jesus. That's, that's their job. That's why we go to church and pay our tithes and, you know, we're, we're making sure they can do that. Well, there again, you're only half right, because of course it's, it's, it's the pastor's job too. But, you know, the Apostle Paul was pretty clear in Ephesians 4 that the, the purpose of the fivefold ministry, the fivefold ministry is the ministry that, that, that function, makes the church function. It's the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Okay, so that's the church ministry. He says the job of the fivefold ministry is to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. So you could take it and say, okay, the pastor's job is to tell you guys to go tell it so that you can go tell it. That's really what it is. Think, of, think about like, uh, you know, we have on staff here at the church with everybody, I think there's about 20 of us total. So if, if, if all 20 of us share, you know, the love of Jesus with as many people as we can, that's good. We should do that. We should, we'd make an impact. But imagine if a church of a thousand shares with all the people they can share, as well as the 20 staff, think of how many people we're going to impact. The multiplication is off the chart. So the job of the, the saints is to be equipped by the, by the church so they can go out and do the work of the ministry. So that it is our job. So I, I hope that, that if you have any misconceptions about what our role is, that, that that clears that up because it's absolutely each and every one of our jobs to make sure that we share our faith in God. So you may say, well, how do I tell it? You know, some of you may say, I, 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 would, I want to, I want to share my faith. I just don't know how. And there's no playbook for this. There's no script. You know, everybody has different giftings. You know, we talk about sometimes like Pastor Roger, you know, he can, he can run into a dude on the sidewalk and in five minutes, the guy's bawling his head off and praying to receive Jesus. You know, not many people like that. Most of us aren't quite that way. You know, and everybody's different. Everybody's different how we approach it. Um, like I said, today we're talking about how we tell it with our words, but over the next couple of weeks, we're going to talk about how our life can tell it, which I think most of us are probably more comfortable with that. You know, if, if I can serve you by telling, to show you the love of Jesus, I'd rather do that than to actually sit down and, and, and take you through the Bible because a lot of us are more comfortable with that. But 
What we're talking about today is actually saying it. And how we say it, I, I think the first thing we could do is we can give our testimony. Giving our testimony is always, always, always a great way to share your faith because people cannot argue with your testimony. Again, the guy in John 9, he said the, the, the Pharisees were trying to beat him down saying, what in the world happened? He finally just said, listen, I was blind, now I see. Amen and amen. That's all I got. You know, he wasn't a Bible scholar, but he had a testimony. And we all have a testimony, church. Every one of us has a story to tell. You know, I, I said it earlier. I, I didn't care a whole lot about people until I got saved. Now I love people. That's huge. You know, I used to get, I used to have road rage all the time. Now I don't, you know, I used to um, not like my dad. Now I do. I mean, whatever it is, you know, there's many things that you could say that God, it's all because of what God did in my life. God's done something in all of our lives. We can share a testimony. The, the Bible says in Revelation 12 that they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. Your testimony is not just a story where you're sitting around a table and telling funny stories. Your testimony is anointed. It has the power of the Holy Spirit to work in people's lives. We overcome by the word of our testimony. Amen. Uh, next, I think we pray for people. Praying for people is great. A lot more people will let you pray for them than you think. Almost everybody will let you pray for them. You know, I remember when we were do, working with the young adults, Joy and I, we, one night when we were all together, we, we told everybody to get out their phone and text three people on their phone that they knew were not, were not Christians and just say, hey, I've been thinking about you today and I want to pray for you. Is there anything I can pray for? And everybody got out their phones and did it. And it was actually pretty fun. That's actually pretty easy. You know, nothing like hiding behind text messaging. That's great. And, uh, and it was amazing because some of the people were literally getting lists from these people like, yes, you can pray, pray for this, 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 this. And it was wonderful because they op it opened a door for them to be able to share with them later. Like, hey, I've been praying for you. How's that situation going? You know, and people will let you pray because the huge, overwhelming majority of people know that if you're praying, it means you care about them even if they don't believe in what you're praying for. And we can do that. We can pray for people. I remember being on a plane a while back and some, this lady sat beside me and she was, you know, she's older than me and she was just talking about her life. And um, she told me that she was, had been raised Catholic, but she really wasn't uh, living any kind of faith at the time. And, and she, was she just, you know how it is on a plane. You just start, people just start pouring out their heart. Next thing I know, she's telling me all this stuff about her family and, and my heart started pounding, but I decided I'm just gonna ask her, you know? So I just looked at her and said, is it okay if I pray for you? And she right away, she, yes, that'd be wonderful. I grabbed her hand and I prayed. And the great thing about praying for somebody is you can preach the gospel to them when you pray. You know, my prayer started out something like, Lord, I thank you, Jesus, that you came to earth and you died on the cross for my sins. I thank you, Lord, that you are the great redeemer, that we have salvation in you, that you forgive us. You know, I just preached the whole gospel and she's sitting there, yes, yes, yes. You know? <laughs> Whereas if I had just been talking to her and said, hey, do you know Jesus died for you? It could have been awkward. And she would have probably been like, mm-hmm. When you're praying, you can do that, you know? And uh, man, I prayed and when I was done, I, I looked at her and she had tears rolling down her face and it was a really powerful moment, you know? So we can always pray for people. That's an easy way to share our faith with others. They'll let you pray. You don't have to pray with, in King James. You can pray in, you know, Grovetown, Georgia, whatever that is, you know, in the, the Southern language, you can even say y'all, God hears y'all. So, so we can pray for people. And, and thirdly and lastly, we can invite them to church. You can invite people to church. We have a huge advantage here in the United States that we have churches everywhere. And you know, uh, a statistic says that 65 to 70% of people said that they would definitely consider going to church if someone they knew invited them. People will come to church and you can invite them. And I think we have even a better advantage here at New Hope. I'm, I mean, I'm a little biased, but I think we have the best people in the world. And if, if somebody comes into this church, they're gonna be greeted and they're gonna be, have their, their neck hugged and they're gonna be, have their hand shaked and they're gonna be loved on and, and they're gonna be treated with dignity and respect and they're gonna be given a cup of coffee and they're gonna come in here and they're gonna hear the word. They're gonna experience the worship experience that we have here and it's gonna be a good thing. So you can invite people to church and chances are they'll come. Now, granted, I know it's a little nervous. I've done it before. I've invited people and I've sat here and I thought, man, if they show up, it's going to make the, I'm going to be awkward because I'm going to want them to really enjoy it, but I don't want to overwhelm them. And, you know, there's a little bit of nerves that come with that, but I've done it and it works out great, you know, and we can do that. We can invite people to church. That's a great way to share our faith. We, we preach the gospel at this church. We talk about Jesus and the cross. And so uh, if people come in here, they're going to experience, they're going to have every opportunity to experience the love of God. So I would encourage you to do that this month and, uh, and all the time to invite people to church. Um, so in conclusion, I'm gonna have you stand with me so I, so I stop talking. I'm gonna, I'm gonna wrap this up here. At the end of the day, what it boils down to for us and going and telling it 
is that it's all about loving people. It's all about loving people. It's all about taking that love that God's given us and sharing it out. You know, we learned that song, uh, This Little Light of Mine, when we were little kids. I'm gonna let it shine. And we say, hide it under a bushel. No, you know, scream it out as we're kids. But when we become adults, it's a little harder to scream that out. You know, we don't wanna hide it, but we don't know exactly. We're not always great at letting it shine real bright. We are called to be the salt of the earth, church. We are the salt. We are to season the earth because of the love that's in us from our heavenly father. And so I wanna challenge you. I got a challenge for you for this month, okay? I'm gonna encourage you this month to think of two people in your life, whether it's coworker, neighbor, family, friend, in-law, outlaw, whatever it is, that you think of two people and you would just reach out to them. Maybe by text, like I said, like we did with the young adults one day, just say, hey, is there anything I can pray for you about? And reach out to those people and say, what can I do or, or, or how can I pray for you? And then eventually invite them to church to come to our Christmas service on the 23rd. We just wanna get them in here because on the 23rd, we're gonna tell them about the love of Jesus in a, in a, in a way that's gonna be fun and exciting and they're gonna experience God. And I, I just wanna challenge you during these to take this seriously and to be intentional about this because you'll forget if you don't. Two people that you can reach out to to pray for them and then even pray with them if you have that opportunity and invite them to church. That's it. It's worth it. You can say, hey, just, you know, really, I don't wanna be weird, but... You know, I'd love for you to come to my church on our Christmas service. It's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be a family service. The kids are going to be in there, you know. Our executive pastor is the bomb. <laughs> Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you for that. Hey, that wasn't a joke. I'm just kidding. No, that's a lie. Don't, don't say that. Just say our church is great. How about that? Um, and, you know, tell them, you know, hey, come to church. I'll take you out to lunch afterwards, you know, and... And it'll be a lot of fun. And, you know, if you can't afford to take them out to lunch, come see Steve. He'll, he'll help. He's got a heart for people, too. And so, uh, but anyway, I really want to encourage you to do that. Can you guys do that? Okay. Uh, we all know two people that need to hear the love of Jesus and uh, try to make it to where, where it's as non-intrusive as possible because we don't want to overwhelm people. We just want to let them know we love them. So I'm going to pray with us as we close tonight, today. And uh, as we go, just going to encourage you this week to just... Just be thinking about this, this series about going and telling it and what that means for you in your life. And you know, make sure you stop by the photo booth, take a picture, take that with you. That can be a good way to a segue into a conversation with someone, show them the picture you got at church. And, and uh, we just pray that, that this month is gonna be really powerful for all of us. And we're not gonna actually have an altar call this morning, but if you wanna come to this altar, especially even after we're done, please feel free to come up and pray. It's definitely open for you to come. Um, and, and the ushers are here. If you want to leave an offering with them as you leave too, God, we're just, we're just so thankful for you. We're excited for this month and uh, just really want to uh, be a blessing to you as a church. So let me pray for us. Father God, we love you today. We thank you today that your love is so great. And Father, I thank you that we can, that we can stand firm knowing that you came to this earth in the form of a little child, all because of your love for us. And that your mandate for us to go and tell it, God, we take that seriously today. I pray, Father, for everyone in this room that you would help us to make it, to be intentional, to make a part of what we're doing. God, that we would not be apathetic, that we would not be fearful, and that we would understand that it is our job, that it is our responsibility, that we are your hands and feet. We are the salt of the earth. We are a city on a hill. God, I pray you'd make that real in each one of our lives today. And for those of us that, whose love has grown cold, God, I pray that you would rekindle it in their lives, Lord. Help them to recapture that faith, that first love that drew us to you in the first place, God. Let us be a church that's excited about our faith in you, excited about what you've done in our life, that we would just be infectious to everyone in our life, that we would see great fruit from it, God, and that ultimately you and you alone would receive all the glory, Lord. We love you so much, Jesus. I pray in Jesus' name, and amen. Amen, amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful day.